Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this video I interview Daniel who works for the Department of Environmental Quality for the state of Idaho. He was surveying a list of waterways when him and his co-workers came across a clan of Sasquatch. We always wonder if certain government employees such as state patrol, game wardens, and public officials know about the existence of Sasquatch and if they ever had to handle a situation like that. Well, this is one of those rare cases where someone working for the government experienced activity while out on the job site and decided to openly talk about it. This was in the summer of 2006. I was a student at the University of Idaho in Moscow, in northern Idaho. Um, and I was given the opportunity to work for the Department of Environmental Quality for the state of Idaho on one of their beneficial use reconnaissance crews, where we basically go out into the woods and uh, are given a list of streams to survey that summer, uh, doing the water quality, temperature, conductivity. Uh, and we also took an amphibian and fish samples. And it was me and two other guys. After our training, we were set loose in Idaho County. And uh, it was just a vast area out there, just completely isolated from everything. We were we worked mainly along the Lock Saw and the Selway Rivers in the Bitterroot Wilderness area along the Idaho-Montana border. And uh, anyway, on this particular trip, uh, it was towards the end of our end of our season. So sometime in August. Uh, we had perfect weather except for one rainstorm that came through a few days before we started noticing things. And on this particular instance, we were headed down a dead end road uh, so that we could go camping. And it was kind of a central location to the streams we were going to be surveying. We head down this dead end road, set up camp. And while we're setting up camp, I could smell huckleberries. And uh, being originally from southeastern Idaho, huckleberry picking uh, was and still is a big deal. It's stuff people actually just take time out of their day and sometimes days off to go and do. So I was pretty excited to to find huckleberries because there's a lot of blackberries down there. And so to find huckleberries, it was it was a good change. So I followed the smell to the to the road we just traveled down. And on the side of the road, uh, on the east side of the road, northeast side of the road, there was a row of huckleberries growing. And so I walk over there and start picking, but I noticed in the in the dirt uh, of the road, uh, there were tracks. There were footprints and not just tracks. They were bare footprints in the dirt. They 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 stood out to me because it had just rained about a day or so before, and they'd broken up the you know the dirt. And I got looking at these things, and I saw two sets of different sizes, or one set of a regular size, well large large track, and a set of smaller tracks. And what caught my eye was how big. The first, the adult, I would call it, the adult footprint was, um, like I said, I'm, I'm about nine and a half, ten size foot, nothing massive, but uh, my coworker, Luke, he was a big, big guy. He is a big, big guy. And uh, it was rivaling uh, his foot in length, but its width was what was really astounding. And I was like, oh my gosh, look at these footprints. And they were going up and down the huckleberry bushes, you know, just like we were. And I just couldn't get over the size of the track. And I told Luke and Remus, my other coworker, I'll call him Remus. Um, I, I just couldn't get over these tracks. And Luke told me, he's like, well, they're just big tracks. Who cares? I'm like, yeah, but one, they're massively wide. <laughs> and two, there's no car tracks down here. 
and we're in the middle of nowhere and all we find are these two sets of tracks and they came out of the woods you could tell where they came out of they followed the row of bushes and then they went back into the woods i'm like so where did these people go and luke he was no nonsense former marine he just was like whatever just just do your thing you know he was never in if it didn't have to do with work he didn't care <laughs> remus on the other hand he he was from the city and <clears throat> he was kind of like me really curious about a lot of stuff and uh you know so he also was kind of enthralled with these tracks as well because it looked to me to be an adult and a child that had been picking these berries and ever since i was a little boy you know we grew up hunting and fishing it's just a really huge part of our culture in southeastern idaho it's not just something we do on the weekend it's it's a part of our life we're, we're substance as hunters we 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 hunt for food and so it's kind of a big deal and tracking is a huge part of that growing up so i was really fascinated by these tracks in fact i just forgot about the berries altogether just trying to figure out what these people yeah, what i was first thinking were doing where'd they come from where'd they go and it, they came from the woods hit the berries and went right back into the woods well after picking a little bit we just went back to camp and carried on our merry little way the next morning we pack up and we head further down the drainage um to hit some more streams uh and the, and we camped on the sandbar at skull creek and uh we had some extra time we kind of busted butt all day and we're had some extra time to go fly fishing so figured let's just catch some fish for for dinner and that's exactly what we did we had a plastic coleman uh bifold table camp table that we put our coleman cooker on cooked up the fish on the skillets and everything and kind of had a later evening um uh, than we wanted to we were just bushed we were just beat we just kind of hurried and ate and we left our plates there on the table thinking well we'll just clean up in the morning we have plenty of time we've carried, covered a lot of streams so that we have that extra time well while i'm getting all my my stuff together my tent and backpack or my tent and sleeping bag and my uh inflatable mattress and everything remus was walking off into the trees to brush his teeth and remus was never an excitable person but he come running back to camp freaking out like he was I, I i have a really hard time recalling anybody me seeing anybody that unnerved and i'm like dude what what's the problem what's going on he goes there's somebody in there there's somebody out there there's some there's it's it's massive it's just massive and i was like calm down what <laughs> what was it a moose? You know, I'm going through this list of critters in my mind that are big that might scare a kid from Seattle. And I was like, could have been a moose, could have been a bear. He goes, no, no, no. He says it was huge. It was dark. It looked like a man and it's trying to hide from us. And in that area, we never saw anybody. We would be out there for days, up to 10 days and not see another human being. There were some militia camps way back in the woods and uh i think that's i this is how i rationalized it was he was worried it's one of these guys messing with us and um i told him i says we're we're totally alone there's nobody he goes no it was it looked like a man it was huge it was dark and it looked like it was trying to hide from us and he was just carrying on and i'm just trying to calm him down and while remus and i were having this discussion uh, Remus was getting louder and louder and more frustrated. And that's when Luke come out of his little pup tent, which was right next to my tent. He comes storming out of that tent, <laughs> pretty torqued with a pistol in his hand, walked up to the edge of the trees and just fired his pistol, almost unloaded his whole clip into the trees. And he looked at us both and he goes, you two just, you know, shut up and go to sleep. And, uh, Reed was, he quieted down, Remus quieted down, and he he finally was like, look, I, I'm 
I'm just going to go to bed. I'm just going to go to bed. I was like, okay. So that night, uh, about 1.30 in the morning, I was woken by a crashing sound. And my first thought was, oh, it's our dishes on our camp table. And it had to be like a raccoon or something, you know, because we left all of our scraps and stuff on the table. Well, and and so that's what I thought was drawing in these these scavengers. And so I throw my headlamp on and I go out. And the table's still standing, but everything on it was gone. Like I couldn't see it. It was just gone. It wasn't piled around the table or nothing. It was gone. And so, you know, kind of groggy, bleary eyed, I walked out there and I'm looking around the sandbar and I start seeing forks and a plate and the cooker. But these were spread yards from where the table was. And so I start going, picking things up, not thinking much about it um at the time but the further i get towards the skull creek and away from the table and i'm still picking up utensils and cooking equipment i kind of looked back at the table and i was like okay so this is weird if it was a bear the bear would have just knocked the table over and rooted around if it was raccoons you know they would have just scattered things about and i'm trying to piece it together and what could have done this and what the only thing i could think of was somebody placing their arm on the table and flinging all the stuff off of that table and that cooker it it flew yards we're not talking feet we're talking yards plates there were forks in the river there you know i had stuff strewn all over the place and I was like, well, we don't see anybody, didn't hear anybody, because we're camped fairly close to the road. We would have heard somebody come up. And then it kind of dawned on me that whatever did this is still here. Because the crash woke me up. I had time enough to just kind of piece things together, get my headlamp on, and go out. And that couldn't have been more than three or four minutes. So when it dawned on me that whatever did this was still here, it kind of freaked me out. I was like, okay. So I just took what I had in my hand, put my head down because I didn't want to get looking around. I was just like, you know what? I'm going right, I'm going back to bed. This is ridiculous. Uh, you know, I was on, to be quite honest with you, I was fairly scared. And I put the stuff on the table, walked into my tent, zipped it up, laid in my sleeping bag and just prayed for sleep, which thankfully came fairly quickly. The next morning, get woken up by Luke, who was all sorts of pissed off. He he was pretty torqued about something. So I get out of my tent and Reed, Remus, was already standing outside of his tent and kind of looking towards Luke's tent, uh, kind of in a in a haze almost. And I look at where Luke's tent was and something had dismantled his tent and placed it upon him in the middle of the night. Now it wasn't like this big fancy tent. It was just one of those little pup tents, you know, whatever did this took the time to take all the tie wires and stuff down and the poles. And they just piled it up on top of Luke, like tried to fold him up up in it in a way. And uh, Luke was pretty torqued about it. And he started questioning Remus and myself over you know which one of us did this and remus said well daniel was up all night i heard him walking around all night and i said no i i woke up to clean up the mess from the from the table and remus heard the crash too and he heard me get up and clean up and go back to bed but according to remus throughout that night he heard me, who he thought was me, walking around the sandbar all night long, you know, in between the tents and everything. And so I start looking for tracks. We all do start looking for tracks because it wasn't me <laughs> and it sure as heck wasn't Luke. And we couldn't see anything in the sand outside of divots. And you, we couldn't tell one divot from the other. So we didn't think too much of it. We were kind of, I was kind of upset that, you know, 
somebody or something was in our camp and we didn't know what. Well, as we're packing everything up to start our day, I noticed that my cooler was missing and it was a red Coleman cooler. Um, nothing fancy is what I always kept my, you know, like my sausages in my kippered snacks, my, you know, tuna fish, whatever can, <clears throat> whatever canned meat that I had, I, I kept in there, but it was gone. And sure we were like a day from being finished but i still was like where did this thing go it had all my protein in it man i was kind of i was kind of torqued but we couldn't spend all day looking for it so we just packed up the truck drove up the road uh, and started surveying another stream just up the drainage and anyway we're going along and remus that whole day was really nervous he normally when we work we worked you know, hundreds of yards from each other doing different tasks on these different sections of the streams, what we call transects. And uh, Remus stayed within sight of myself. He he didn't wander off very far. He was pretty shaken from the night before, from what he saw the night before, which he maintained to be in a big man. And um, anyway, Remus came down, told me he was going to pop off into the woods to use the restroom and so i kind of hung out where he last left me that was kind of what we did where if one of us had to go do do anything in the woods we'd tell the other and the other one would stand right where we last saw him because that stuff that woods those woods up there are thick a lot different than i was used to in southeastern idaho with sagebrush quakies pines you know open fields and stuff there it's thick like the temp the, you could feel a temperature change when you went into the woods. It's just thick, dense stuff. And so we didn't mess around with people getting lost. Well, as I'm standing there, after Reed left me, uh, a few minutes into it, I hear, I hear Remus hollering uh, for me to go, to go to him. So that's exactly what I did. I just dropped my gear and walked into the trees. And we see all of these wrappers and cans laying around. And then I see a chunk of my cooler. And I realize this is my stuff. <laughs> you know, and we're at this point, we're a good mile or mile and a half from our first camp because this was our first stream in the day. And so we haven't really traveled very far, about a mile, mile and a half as the crow flies um, anyway. And you see, chunk of my cooler and then there's the other chunk you know over there and when i say chunk the cooler and this has always gotten me this has always bothered me there weren't any claw marks there weren't any teeth marks on anything the wrappers the tin cans nothing the cooler was just devoid of any claw or teeth marks like a, a, they're pretty obvious and uh it was just busted in half like somebody and there was no need to break it in half because you could just take the lid off, move the handle, take the lid off and there you go. But it was busted in half. It looked like to me that somebody took either side with their hand and just ripped it in half and tossed one chunk one way and one chunk the other. And so I'm looking at the cans, hoping to find, you know, canine marks, teeth marks of any kind. Because the cans have all been, they'd all been opened. Um, I Like the Kippered Snack can was the only one that we found that had anything that resembled what we would think of as, as a tooth mark. And it looked like somebody would hit it with a big or a wide screwdriver and just kind of drove it down the side a little bit. That was the closest thing we found to any type of tooth mark or scratch mark on anything. Everything else had been ripped open. Um, you know, it, it just, it just kind of baffled us. So we gathered up all the garbage, we placed it in one of our bags and we went back to work. Nothing else out of the ordinary happened that day, even though that was for me quite enough. That was bizarre. So we finished our jobs, all of our stream work, and, uh, we end up <clears throat> deciding to camp on a mountain 
overlooking the drainages that we had just worked because yeah, it was pretty it was one of our last nights out there and just a nice place to camp and just look at everything and just be in the quiet of it all and so we're we're sitting there around the fire the sun's going down and we're passing around a bottle of wine and uh which was what we did on our last day every time it was just kind of our tradition and all of a sudden we start hearing this i don't want to say scream it was a whoop from down where we were just working that day down down the canyon and i've never in my life heard anything that powerful i've heard lions roar at like zoos uh i've heard bull cows bellering in the woods at night i've heard all sorts of strange sounds from from mountain lions and bears and foxes and coyotes but they're all within the realm of reality this was unreal this was unbelievable it still haunts me to this day that just the sound and it wasn't until a few years ago when i was with my boys uh we were at the boise zoo and the gibbons gibbon monkeys started freaking out that i was like that's as close as it gets if it were lower and a lot longer sustained because when the first time up on the mountain that i heard that sound my first thought was monkey i'm from idaho we don't have monkeys here and i i don't know why that was my first thought but that's what it was it wasn't a person it wasn't a person and i thought this is that that's a monkey that's you know though we're we don't have any here but that's what this is and it was long it was low and it was sustained just this droning whoop it wasn't a scream it was a whoop, like almost siren like in a way and we all just kind of stood there even luke was kind of frozen for a second this this guy who's a combat veteran and a veteran of the marine corps and he was like what you know he just kind of looked at me and was like what i'm like i have no idea and remus was was beside himself he didn't want to hear it anymore and it just kept going for a couple hours that night it didn't sound like it got any closer but i can tell you it was at least within a mile of our location it didn't it didn't get any closer it didn't get any further away uh, it just this maintained whoop. Well, the next day we gather up our stuff and head back into town. And we're supposed to surrender our samples over to the the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And so we went to our supervisor's office, handed over our stuff, went through that whole process, paperwork, everything, and our our supervisor, his name was Daniel as well. And he, so how, how was it guys? You know, there's just the same, same set of questions that he always gave us. And we're like, oh, it was, it was well, except for, you know, we had something happen at camp and we had something happen at camp. And, and he's like, oh really, what, what happened? And, and so we told him exactly what, remus had seen and what had happened at the camp and you know daniel was a really jovial guy really really nice guy i really like him a lot and he was like well you know about you know every three years or so one of my crews comes across him you know and and we we're all kind of like giggling because at this point we we knew that you know he was talking about sasquatch you know because it was I told him, I says, I have no other explanation outside of this. And that's when he's like, well, you know, every three years, one of our crews comes across him and we're kind of giggling to ourselves, despite what all had happened. And then he got really dead serious. And he said, if any of you speak about this in public to anybody, while you're an employee for the state of Idaho, your job will be forfeit immediately. He goes, we, you just don't talk about it let it go it was just an odd occurrence you know which really bothered me because there we were just a second ago him giggling well you know 
people see it every now and again. I cut my cruise every few years to shifting gears to saying, however, if you guys talk about this as state employees, you're going to be fired immediately. And he that was the most serious I'd ever seen that man. And we all we all were kind of taken aback. We thought, oh, okay, well, he's dead serious. This guy's dead serious because he doesn't act like this. And you could almost tell that he'd been through this this discussion before that he's had to tell other crews the same thing because of how just how easily he delivered it and how but how sternly he he put the point across and from that point on we did streams within grangeville idaho and lewis lewiston idaho and winchester just small streams that go through towns and stuff we 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 didn't go back into the mountains after that because of our our season was finished and then we all went back to school and that that's always kind of stuck with me the the camp incident the sound that this critter made and then the shift in daniel's personality and how serious he was about it about talking about this creature it was it was odd to say the least and that's that's my story i suppose okay well i appreciate you sharing your experiences with me and i have a few questions to ask whenever you're ready yeah okay so when you were working out there by the mines you were extremely far out in the wilderness, correct? Right. Okay. So when you discovered those tracks, your assumption was that they were picking berries? Yeah, it was obvious what they were doing, to me anyway. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of reports of Sasquatch picking berries all across the United States. Yeah, it was it was fairly clear because they went right up the row of bushes and back. And, you know, we had to reach. In fact, we had to get up on the uh, the bank. Uh, I don't know what else you'd call it. The easy pickings were gone. Let's say that. And so we had to kind of get back into the bushes a little bit to get some berries. So whatever these things did, they fairly picked these bushes clean that were right there and, and quite accessible. Mm hmm. And at any point, did you think it was a grizzly bear or did they distinctly look like human tracks, just much larger? Oh, these were humans. I I had done studies on grizzly bears and that in Yellowstone. I've seen grizzly bear tracks. I'm quite familiar with them. These were human-shaped tracks, These, but they were just really wide and really big. These were not bear tracks at all. Okay. And these berries, did they parallel the river? Yeah, the river where we were camping made a, a small dog leg, but yeah, they were right there next to the river. You you could have thrown a rock and hit the river. Okay, yeah, and can you explain to us what kind of food you would find in this river as far as like mussels or fish? Right, yeah, um, there was lots of frogs, lots and lots of frogs. There was lots of fish. You had steelhead, you had your brook trout, rainbow trout. And it was plentiful. In fact, we would part of our job was to electrofish to gather fish specimens, and we were always busy just scooping up. There were snakes and frogs, a uh, lot of rock. What would you call them? Uh, oh, the larvae of the fly. A lot of larvae floating around. A lot. There, yeah, you could easily live live there if you didn't mind eating squishy stuff. That's for sure. Yeah, so it was the perfect job as far as being able to fish on your off time and being out in the wilderness. It was, like I said, it was like camping. They gave us a, a truck, a map. We just had to provide our camping equipment. That we They gave us the cooking gear, and they just kind of cut us loose all summer long, and I loved it. Yeah. So if you would kind of... Explain to us how worked up your friend was when he saw this man hiding behind the trees. Like I said, I I have a hard time recalling 
coming across anybody that rattled. Um, I don't think I came across anybody that rattled uh, until I became a volunteer firefighter. And you have car wreck scenes where people have to be uh, extruded. And you have family members that are concerned and just be beside themselves with a mixture of like just disbelief and adrenaline and fear. And that's how Remus was. He, I had to put my hands on him and almost shake him and just be like, calm down, calm down. It was probably a moose, probably was a bear. And he looked me dead in the eye and you could see that, that fear, that disbelief. He said, no, it's huge. It's dark. And it was a man. It looked like a man and it was trying to hide. It scared him. I would say close to death. He as close to death as you can be for being scared. And it, it, it's haunts, it haunts me, you know, and it really bothered me to see him that way because what do you do? You know, before then I, I had like first aid training and stuff, but I'd never had experience with somebody going into shock while they're standing there talking to you. And that's what it was like. And me just trying to get his attention and just let him know everything's going to be okay. And like I say, that was the conversation it became loud enough and raucous enough for Luke to come out with his pistol and just shoot into the trees and tell us to shut up. <laughs> you know, it was, it was unnerving. Yeah, that is terrifying. So after that incident, something came up to camp and started rummaging through your guys' stuff. Yes. It was after that, when we went to bed that something came and flung all of our stuff cooking ware and plates and utensils out towards the river and into the river. In some cases, some of the plates and forks were in the river. And, uh, and then evidently when I went back to bed, uh, Remus could hear this thing wandering around the camp and then waking up to Luke screaming about how mad he is at us for, you know, we're not that funny. This is ridiculous because something had piled up his tent on top of him. So it was almost, to me, it was almost like they were targeting him in a way because he was the one that came out with the gun. You know, we weren't supposed to have guns out there as state employees, but considering the what we were doing and where we were going and how remote things were, our supervisor said, you're not supposed to carry guns, but carry a gun, you know. And uh, he was the only, he was the one that was entrusted with, you know, bringing his own firearm. And I, I feel like they were kind of targeting or whatever did this was targeting him in a way by piling up his tent on top of him. I know that seems kind of childish, but, you know, I think they also understood he was armed. So you just do what you can do, I guess. I don't know. It was weird. Yeah. And after you heard the whoop and the vocalizations coming from the woods, what feeling did you get? What do you think they were trying to communicate? You know, that's a, that's a question I wish I could answer, you know, um, outside of what in the world made this noise was making this ruckus, but why they would be down there or the one be down there because it sounded like it came from the same individual would be down there you know, pitching a fit and causing all kinds of ruckus is, is beyond me. What, why would they do that? I don't know. I haven't an answer for that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe they wanted more food or they were upset that somebody had a gun and they were in their territory. Yeah. You know, that's something I thought too, is because it, why else would you make a sound like that, that, that carries the way that sound carries if you weren't trying to warn others or communicate something to others. I don't think it was alone. I, I don't think a lot of these creatures travel very far out of earshot of each other. You know, um, if you think about surviving in the wild and, and all that stuff, you're, there's going to be points where you're going to need help and smart thing to do is to kind of stay within the earshot of, of somebody else or assistance. And I, I don't know, I, it almost, but I do know it was trying to communicate something, whether it was to us, I doubt it. 
um, because I, again, I'd never heard that sound. I don't know what that means. I think it was trying to communicate to others somewhere, but what it was trying to communicate, that's beyond me. Yeah, absolutely. They were definitely communicating to one another and what they were saying. It's hard to tell. Right. So your boss was willing to let you go if you openly talked about what you experienced out in the wilderness. Is that correct? Yes. As long as we were uh, state employees and we openly spoke about this with anybody, um, then, yeah, he said our, our job would be forfeit immediately is what he told us. Yeah. Well, for one, that tells me that these creatures exist and he knows about them. And two, it's been talked about at work and it's protocol to fire someone if they talk about it. Right. And, you know, in my mind, I tried kind of, you know, because I I like Daniel a lot. Um, But in my mind, I was trying to protect him in a way thinking, well, he's just he's just making sure that, that, you know, the state doesn't have these kooks working for him that are out there ranting and raving about Sasquatch. But why is that such a why is that a fireable offense? You know, later I, I got thinking that why is that such a fireable offense if somebody they can you know you can believe religiously whatever you want to believe and still work for the state you can even talk about you know aspects of your religion openly while working for the state but the second you talk about sasquatch or anything that happened to you regarding even a sniff of a whisper within the neighborhood of this topic you're gone that never sat right with me yeah absolutely i mean it's part of my belief that, you know, God created everything, including the Sasquatch. So it's something that I'm interested in and I want to know more about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So See. did you ever go back to this area after those experiences? I never have. I've I've wanted to for quite some time because it was a chunk of my life that I loved. It was a time in my life that the most free i'd ever been probably since like a teenager and beautiful area and i've always wanted to go back to skull creek and the bitterroot wilderness just to just to go back i i never have you know whether it's because i was a poor college student or now i'm so busy with my current job that i haven't made time to go back but if i could i would i would love to go back um, if nothing else, just to, I guess, face a lot of questions I have and, and the reality of what had happened. Cause there is a part of me that's like, oh dude, don't go back up there. That's craziness. But then there's another part of me that says, you got to figure out what happened, you know, and maybe with an, a more adult mind and, you know, going through that area and having the time to go through it, I might find some answers to questions but then again i might not but i would love to go back again like i said i never seen this thing i just heard it and dealt with the mess it made i i had never seen the thing maybe if i would have seen it like remus did i wouldn't go back i can almost guarantee you right now if i were to speak with remus he would be like nope there's no way just that look in his eye but because i didn't see it Maybe I'm foolish enough to be like, yeah, I'll go back there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And as a researcher, you had the perfect recipe to bring in the Sasquatch. I mean, you guys were out there in their camp and you guys had food outside. So that usually draws them in. Right. And I think also I've thought about that as well. Um, I think also the curiosity because there just isn't human traffic out there. But all of a sudden, there's these things, you know, there we were. And I think just our presence alone in such a vast wilderness, in such a desolate area, as far as human life goes, or human, you know, um, presence goes, I think that alone is a curiosity. You know, um, all of a sudden, we're right up on their doorstep. I'm like, oh, what are these things? You know, the next thing you know, you're getting shot at. And so, but, but yeah, I think just our presence alone, beside food, beside the point, food, just just being there, 
was enough for them to be like, oh, what's this? You know? Yeah, absolutely. And we've talked about this before, and I've asked you if you thought there was a connection with the Sasquatch and the mines, and I'll kind of give you an explanation why I think there is. Um, These creatures would gift rocks, they'll stack rocks, and sometimes make rock circles. And I find that a lot of these rocks are like iron or they have crystal in them. You know, there's something special about the rocks that they pick up. So it seems like they're seeking out certain minerals and resources. And I think that's why they're attracted to these mines. Right. And I, you know, down, down here in Southeastern Idaho, we, we mine uh, phosphate ore, and that means a lot of times we're mining right next to like limestone beds and we have animals all the time in our pits cut from you know coyotes to deer to elk and moose and a lot of the times um you'll find these animals up on the high wall licking the minerals the salts coming out and i wonder if that's what draws these creatures as well or the rarer minerals the salts and stuff that we expose through our mining process because there are i've got co-workers that have seen these things firsthand within you know a few hundred feet and some of them some of them say that it's you know oh they were just bears they were just bears and some of them say they're bears you know they're just bears and then the guy that's like right next to him that sees the same thing goes, it's on two legs. <laughs> that's not a bear. So, you know, I, th- I think you're onto something with the, with the rocks. I personally feel that in my part of Idaho, uh, these corridors are, you know, um, migratory. And when they come through here late fall, early winter, and then return in the spring, they're visiting these mineral deposits. That's just that's just my point of view. Now, as I've heard of, you know, get them giving gift rocks and whatnot. I've never met anybody personally that's come, at least not around from here anyway, that's come across that. But uh, I know that it is a thing, and you may be may well be right on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. They could be coming by to lick the minerals that are coming out of the ground. I know a lot of animals depend on that to survive out in the forest and some of the rocks that I have found are perfect for, you know, ambushing deer and stuff just because it's made out of iron and it's a lot harder than your regular rocks that you'd find out in the woods. And right. Yeah. It it could be very possible. And also like when the weather gets really bad, it could be a, a good way for them to, you know, get out of the harsh conditions by getting into some of these caves or, you know, whatever's there. Right, and and there are a lot of reclaimed mining areas um, around here. Here it's open pit mining, but the the geology gets changed in a lot of ways, and there are sections of these reclaimed mines that get way less snow than others and are sheltered from harsh weather. So, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so are you still going out into the wilderness today doing work? Yeah, I, I, I work at one of the mines here, and that's we're out in the middle of, out in the middle of the woods. We're between Idaho and Wyoming, right in the woods. We're so yeah, we're out in the middle of nowhere. It's just us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if you ever encounter anything again. Feel free to get a hold of me, and if you come across anybody with any Sasquatch stories, let me know. I I will do that for sure. All right, Daniel. I think this covers your experiences, and I really appreciate you reaching out to me and getting in contact. Yeah, thank you for, for listening to me. Yeah, absolutely. And feel free to reach out anytime you have any questions, and yeah, we're done for now. Okay, I sure will. Thank you. All right, Daniel. Well, you have a good day, and we will talk later. 
Perfect. You too, man. All right. Take care. See ya. All right, Daniel, I really appreciate you for sharing your encounter from the state of Idaho and for confirming the higher up people know about the Sasquatch. It really takes a lot of courage to tell the truth, even if that means risking your job and credibility. The activity he experienced sounds all too familiar and the best way to experience Bigfoot activity is to get out and spend some time in the woods because you're not going to find them on the couch. Isn't that what deer hunters say? You can't kill them from the couch. All right. I hope you guys come back for more Sasquatch action. Just give me a chance. All right. See you guys.